So welcome. Thank you all for being here. Um, my name is Chris Howard. I'm the principal systems engineer at Recursion Pharmaceutical. Um, we are a well-funded biotech startup. Six years um, is now, and we have two drugs already in the clinic, in clinical trials. Um, and we do things a little bit differently, and I hope to show you in the next few minutes. Um, I'm not a PhD level scientist, and um, I'll give you a little bit of a 30,000 foot overview and a little bit of a deeper dive into the things that I touch on a daily basis. Um, so human biology is extremely complex, um, and it's really hard for us to understand everything that's going on. The pace of drug discovery has slowed over time. Um, it takes generally 10 years to get one drug into the clinical trials and into the market, uh, and it's inordinately expensive to do. Um, and because biology is really complex, all the low-hanging fruit has pretty much already been picked. Uh, in order to find new treatments, uh, we need to more fully understand the complexity of humans, and uh, it's a little bit hard for us to understand ourselves. So that's where machine learning is coming in for us. Um, an example of another machine learning application from geospatial mapping uh, can show us the way. In 99, Digital Globe uh, launched the world's first commercial high-resolution Im imaging satellites, enabling us to map almost the entirety of planet Earth in a matter of days. Um, and this is what powers most of Google Maps. Uh, with these satellite images from space, we can use machine learning to answer complex problems such as real-time traffic, identifying areas of conflict, and better predict emerging weather patterns. Um, so we asked, what if you do that with biology? What if you are able to map it and understand it in that way? Um, but instead of taking pictures through satellites, we have um, high-resolution pictures that are taken through microscopes. And so this right here is an example of what we do. Um, that's one of our pictures of a well of experiments. Um, so using cellular images, um, we can leverage machine learning and ask complex questions about biology. So how do disease cells differ from healthy cells? Uh, we want to quantify and analyze hundreds of different features at this single cellular level to make this determination. And when we do add compounds, we want to see a rescue in high dimensional morphology. Um, importantly, we're looking for a uh, high dimensional readout of cellular biology and just not one or two features of the cell. So, um, so what we're, yeah, there we go. So what we're doing is we take our, our baseline and we create a, a phenotype of what a healthy cell looks like. And then we take and we make disease cells. And so we either do that, uh, we started out doing it with siRNA, where we could knock down one gene and do uh, monogenetic loss of function diseases. And, um, but then siRNA, you can only get it in so many different compounds and knock down so many genes. And now we actually are using CRISPR in order to be able to do uh, multi-genetic diseases and as well as we've done an NIH study on cell senescence, uh, we've done uh, malaria research, and um, we're just trying to hit really as many as we can. We started out with rare genetic diseases, but this platform, as we've developed it, um, we're not interested in specializing on one particular thing. We wanna be able to map human biology, map how drug interactions work, and then Essentially what we're doing is we're creating vectors and we're doing vector math to say, okay, this is what this disease uh, phenotype looks like and when we hit it with these drugs, it rescues it in this way. And so we think that this could be a drug that maybe off-label will work for this disease or is something that might be able to continue. Uh, we have a massive uh, automated biology platform uh, we got robots, we have plates that are about this big that have 1536 wells on them, and we do 1536 experiments per run uh, on a well, and so we do about 
350,000 experiments a week. Uh, we take about 7 million images of those experiments. And uh, we have about 22 billion bytes. Um, well, we're actually somewhere around four petabytes right now of our proprietary data set. And we actually just had a, co a Kaggle competition with um, trying to normalize batch effects across these experiments and figure out that these little variations in how the experiments happen, how to normalize that so that our data actually makes sense. Um, so we've invested about $200 million in our platform to date. Um, our high throughput screening system rivals any of the big pharma. Um, and it's just fun to play with these stats. Uh, we've got about a 100,000 square foot facility we took over from Dick's Sporting Goods with an 85 foot climbing wall. So it's pretty fun. Good way to relax when you need to think about something else for a minute. Um, Exascale is, the Exascaler has really given us what we need in order to feed the GPUs. In all machine learning, in everything you're doing, feeding the GPUs is always the problem. Get the data there as fast as possible so that you can process it, get it out, and get your model trained. And then do inference on your images. Uh, we have a program called Cell Profiler that goes through and it looks for micronucleation of uh, DNA. It looks for um, mitochondrial uh, deformities, it looks for cardiac toxicity, it looks for all sorts of different cell features and insights that you can pull about the disease from those cell features. And our uh, model that we've trained through this platform actually will outperform Cell Profiler now. So we are, this quarter, uh, ditching that software that we've been using forever and essentially eating our own dog food and using our models that we've trained up on our platform in order to find and extract these cell features and continue feeding in a positive feedback loop. Um, we currently have an ES400 um, with a flash layer, and we stub the first 64K of every file onto that, and then in the rest of it goes to an ES7900, and it is wicked fast. Um, so this is just a configuration of how we have it. We have two um, with one expansion on there, and we've got about two petabytes that we use for our staging area for our machine learning training. Um, so our platform is capable of multiple areas of biology, including genetic diseases, immunology, inflammation, and infectious disease. Uh, we can run drug screens on both small molecules and biologics. Um, and we're continuing to move forward. We have our computational chemistry division that last week during our recursion hack week uh, created a trillion compound database that they can do similarity searches against uh, using the GPUs to accelerate that. Um, we started out uh, violating our end user license agreement and running on 1080 Ti's in our data center. And um, they work pretty well, but now we have 32 gig V100s that work way better. Um, so we're deploying our technology to create a broader, faster, more efficient pipeline. Today, um, I mean, the process is long, expensive, it's prone to high failure rates. You get everything submitted to the FDA and then find out that you're not gonna be able to move forward after you've dropped millions of dollars on these drugs. Uh, using our platform, we're changing the drug discovery paradigm. We're creating a process that is highly scalable and accelerated, where failure is pushed to the beginning of the process. And we know, and we've worked with other uh, drug companies to take and validate their drugs against their particular diseases so that they can know whether or not to move forward and whether that's a good investment of their time and money. Um, so, um, yeah, like I said, we push it back to the beginning. Um, so we have 30 active programs in less than five years. And these are all drugs that will make a difference to people. Um, we've had 
the patients come in and talk to us. Uh, the first drug that our founder found in his PhD program uh, was for a disease called cerebral cavernous malformation. And it's really rare. And sorry. When these people come in and they've lived their life for 30, 40 years, and then their brain stem starts bleeding. And, and they get seizures, and their whole life is just done. To know that we have a drug that will allow them to live their life normally again, it makes a difference for us. Um, so we have uh, about 140, 150 people right now, and we're growing fast. We're going to have 200 probably by the end of the year, and we're going to keep going from there. And everyone who's at Recursion is an expert in their field. And one of the things that's really cool about them that I think differentiates them from a lot of companies I've worked for is they take really smart people and then they listen to them and they implement what needs to happen. Um, yeah, we have 41 PhDs, 28 master's degrees. 40% uh, of our people are biology and chemistry. Uh, we have a huge development department that creates all the tools to be able to design experiments, to implement these on the fly. Um, I am the HPC guy, like the only one. So <laughs> um, if any of you want to come play. Um, and yeah, if you want to come play, we're in Salt Lake. Uh, that's our technical recruiter, Aaron. He'll be more than happy to take your resume and bring you along. Um, we provide lunch every day. and. <laughs> It's honestly, it's a great place to work, and there's really good people there. It's a fun culture. Um, we're really focused on diversity and inclusion and giving people a voice. Um, and yeah, any questions about our platform, about how we do it? Yeah, we've got uh, mics here if you want to raise your hand. But thank you so much, Chris. I mean, uh, awesome. And I think that really highlights a lot of the reason a lot of us are in this area, right? I mean, the research that we do, uh, whether it's academic or commercial, um, for whatever reason, it's out there changing the world, changing people's lives. It's pretty awesome, so thanks for telling that. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Yeah, just keep talking. He'll get it. Thank you, thank you for this interesting conversation. Um, I'm more interested in the <clears throat> phenotypes. I, I know you're more focused on the cell biology type. But right. When it comes to genomics, human genomics to cotton genomics to plant genomics, it's just genomics. Right. Complexity might differ. Do you, there are two questions. Number one, do you work with any researchers, university researchers as a collaborative space within your pharmaceutical research process. Number two is within the phenotype engagement or cell biological models, mm -hmm. do you draw knowledge or algorithmic value from other types of uh, plant genomics related research processes um, yeah, as we, contemporary methods. Yeah, we have, I mean, we have our own journal clubs inside and we're always looking at research from th everything that's being published and trying to integrate that into how we look at these models and try and inform better how the different aspects weight in our phenotypes and, um, yeah. And as far as collaboration, I mean, yeah, we, we bring in researchers from other places, and we have uh, fellows and advisors that we work with a lot. Uh, Yashua mm -hmm. helps us a lot with our um, AI machine learning and whatnot, so. Thank you. I've got, a, I've got actually a, a really simple question. Okay. A lot of these life sciences uh, companies seem to have an annoying habit of putting Windows workstations in front of all the microscopes and stuff. Do you have that issue with your systems here? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, our scopes have a 32-bit Windows program that writes out single-threaded to a landing zone. And then from there, we have to take it and 
we've been working with them, and hopefully we, in the very near future, will be able to make some serious improvements to that. But, I mean, we have like 12 scopes writing out to a NAS, and each one will max out at like 50 megabytes a second, which, I'm like, yeah, come on, guys. <laughs> My Luster file system will do like 80 gig. Come on. <laughs> So I think that was part of my question, but can you talk a little bit about the infrastructure, the networking that you have for that ingest? And yeah. then also what's the networking or infrastructure between your storage and your GPU systems or other systems? Yeah, so um, when I was brought on, we had two super micro servers with eight 1080 Ti's on them, and we had a 100 gig Mellanox Ethernet that was connecting them, and they were trying to put together a Gluster file system. And I just laughed, and I was like, no, no. That's not going to work. And they're like, yeah, we just can't seem to make it work. I'm not sure why. Um, so I came on board, and we built out a Lustre POC on super micro equipment. And uh, stay towards the LTS. If you have any option, if you're not trying out one particular like feature of Lustre, stay towards the long-term release. I, of course installed 2.11, and it was bleeding edge at that point, and that was stupid. Um, I mean, I would, if I rebooted a node in my cluster, and then as it was replaying the transaction logs, one of my OSSs would kernel panic and reboot, always. And that was awesome. Um, but thankfully, now that I have a supported exascaler, that's not an issue, and it's actually on a long-term release, which is awesome. Um, we have some Dell 4140s with 32 gig B100s in them, uh, and they have NVLink built into those machines. Uh, when I moved everything from our data closet, which was literally a closet that had a split unit, pouring water down on top of the rack once, I screamed like a little girl. Um, and when we moved that out to the data center, uh, we put in a Mellanox EDR and Finiband backplane uh, it's just in a star topology because I have 18 nodes, um, so I haven't had to build out my fat tree yet, but I got it in the works. Um, and um, and then, really, I, I went to EDR mainly for the RDMA and being able to do like GPU direct and write directly into my GPU memory. So um, we had Slurm and Singularity for our scheduler. And that worked really well. And then now we're doing a POC with uh, Determined AI and trying to get things working with them. And they require Docker, which kind of bums me out. But at the same point, like because it's so small, like they can trash my cluster and I can rebuild it in a matter of hours. So, anyone else? Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, I missed the beginning of the talk, but I'm just basically wondering what sort of microscopes and cameras you're using. Because we have a bunch of microscopes, but it might not be the same thing. Um, they are, I, I actually couldn't even tell you the brand. Are they cryosids? What? Cryos? Thermo Fisher? They're, I don't know. And, uh, I mean, we were doing 20x exposures, and we had to take four um, pictures per well. And then we just went down to 10x, and we've been down sampling. I mean, we started out at, like, 1024 uh, by 1024, and we've been down sampling them, and now we're getting like 8-bit images, and honestly, it's not affecting the accuracy of our machine learning, which is pretty amazing. And it takes up a lot less space. Thank you, thank you very much, Chris. Cool, thank you. Great.